It's a tremendous, um, it's a tremendous honor and pleasure to be here, and a little daunting after the deeply familial uh, uh, and intelligent words that Jay put on the table that made this feel like a family that I've always watched from the side with great admiration. And even more so knowing that Larry is here and you just want me off the stage. So uh, you can hear a little bit from him, uh, but that's, um, uh, that's been one of the great pleasures of this uh, uh, friendship of many years. Um, what I want to try to do, though, can you uh, put this up there, or where are we standing here in terms of... So, um, let me try to spend the next um, uh, 35 or so minutes um, suggesting to you uh, how Creative Commons is changing the world in a way that is deeper and broader even than Rick was suggesting in his um, uh, rousing uh, initial words. Um, and primarily, I want to try to tie the enormous work that you have been doing for so long to the broader debate we now have over the future of capitalism, and in particular, its relationship to the social environment, to inequality, um, to the kind of capture of politics that Larry's been dedicating his life to, and now even more so uh, than ever. Um, <clears throat> how do we get from the remarkable image of this kid whose mother's frustration and, and uh, the attack on his mother for uh, uh, uploading a video of his dancing relate to the future of capitalism? How do we connect these things? The first thing that you have to say, that I have to say before we go into this, is that it's impossible to walk on the streets of Seoul, and this is really my first time here, or to ride the subway here from the hotel without recognizing the enormous value of growth in markets. Simply waving it away is impossible, but that's not the point. The critical thing that commons allow us is a beginning of a way to understand how we make market societies without replicating the kinds of stresses we've seen and we know about the uh, um, um, natural environment and um, uh, the threats that we've been seeing, particularly in the last 40 years, since the 1980s, to the social environment, to inequality. So this is the, the you see very clearly, perhaps more so than anywhere else in the US, the 1980s is an inflection point where inequality and the uh, share of wealth at the top increases. You see that it's not everywhere in the world in, in, in uh, um, uh, main, uh, 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 in continental Europe, the same inflection point did not happen in the same way, but we certainly see it throughout many of the English speaking languages. We're certainly beginning to see it even in developing economies that the 1980s presented a certain shift away from a more inclusive uh, general sense of increased welfare across the board and to a much more highly uh, uh, segmented and, and unequal distribution of wealth. Um, and there's a sense in which this has been part, and this was the core um, uh, economic explanation, that this was in part a function of automation. And that as we look forward, the great threats in a sense are robotics, um, um, uh, software that allows uh, uh, for greater automation and requires and gives only returns to skill and not to everyone, and that that's what's driving it, that fundamentally markets are functioning well, but that we're having a problem with distribution of skills. I think it's important to recognize that when we talk about inequality or the destabilization of markets, we're really talking about two phenomena, and the U.S. in this regard is ahead of the curve, but probably uh, diagnostic of where many countries may go if we don't understand the limitations of neoliberal conceptions of markets very early on. <clears throat> One is the stagnation and lack of, of um, uh, security of uh, the middle classes and the majority of people in the population. And the other is the rising extreme wealth, in this case of the top 1%, of the population, which is fundamentally a problem of oligarchy, not envy. Fundamentally a problem that this extreme wealth, 
gets translated into political power, which in turn distorts the entire political system and which Larry is dedicating so much of his life now, all of his life, I guess, except for the slivers he can preserve uh, uh, for his family um, uh, to now. Uh, these are two quite distinct phenomena, and we see them over time. And as you look, for example, at graphs of changes in the ratio, again, the data from the US is clearest and has been subject to the most extensive um, 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 uh, empirical research. So I'm putting it on the table, not because it's just an American problem, but because it's the one that's clearest. What we see in the 80s, increased inequality between the 10th percentile and the 50th, between the 50th and the 90th. But really since 1990, everyone below the very top has been stagnating and the only thing that has been growing has been inequality at the very top. If we try to understand why, what I'm going to do very quickly and I don't expect everyone to get all the details, that's not the point for now because really what I want to emphasize is the role of the commons. But what we see is that at the very top, what has changed is the shape of compensation, where the top 1% and half percent and 0.1% increasingly are earning their income from crazy incomes at the very top. And at the bottom, partly in the US, it's the unionization, but across the OECD, which is what you see down here, it's the rise of contingent work. It's the rise of instability um, uh, in the workplace and, and income volatility across the world. Trust me, I'm getting to the comments. Contingency is not brand new. We've seen in the US, it begins in the 60s uh, with Kelly girls and temp agencies primarily as women's work. But what we're seeing today is an increasing technological embodiment of uh, contingent work now sometimes called sharing economy, and as Jay was talking about celebration of sharing, um, this is not sharing, this is extraction. And one of the things we need to insist on is that sharing is sharing. And contingent work under extractive conditions is contingent work under extractive conditions. And don't use us to legitimate you. That we all need to understand this quite fundamentally. If we look at the outcomes of the extreme inequality at the top and the stagnation at the bottom, and we begin to look at the various institutional mechanisms, the stock options, the norms of high payment, the superstar pay, uh, the fact that people are trying at the top to get the same kind of pay, the increase of contingent work, what they all really resolve to, one of the things if you look, these are not ideologically uh, variable in the normal sense of political ideology. If you look at the shape of inequality in the US, it's rather flat throughout both Republicans and Democrats in the, 60, in the 40, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and shoots up and continues irrespective of whether it's Republicans or Democrats, whether it's uh, 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 first um, uh, conservatives or labor in the UK, it continues. And the reason that it continues is because it's not driven by ideology in the small political sense, but it's driven by ideology in the deep sense of how we understand the nature of human beings, how we understand the nature of markets and law that needs to apply to these human beings. I promise I'll get to comments. It's about ideas, and this is where the commons comes as a replacement. It's about what it means to be a rational human being, to be acquisitive, to be self-interested, to act with guile. What it means to actually have a well-functioning system you need to get the incentives right. You need clear property rights. What it means to try to create innovation and creativity and growth. More property rights, tighter property rights. We just saw the TPP passed um, 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 uh, at some level. Increased property, that's the way you build the best form of markets. You need to free markets from uh, regulation. That's the way you get systems to work given the kind of human beings we are and the kind of market society we are. And that's where we come. Google Ngram is not an ideal way to do research, but to give you a little bit of a sense, if you look at all of the books in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, American English, you see that around World War I, there's an inflection point where solidarity becomes a more important word or more common word than fairness or rationality or incentives. And that continues through the late 60s. But beginning in the late 50s and really inflecting 
around mid-70s to, to 1980s, the idea of incentives and rationality captures the imagination at the expense of solidarity and fairness. Part of what happens is that the inflation across major market societies in the 1970s collapses the belief in the possibility of a well-functioning, well-ordered, state-based regulated market. And with that collapse, something else needs to step in. And that something else becomes the neoliberal ideology of people individually acting uh, on theory. So we have various specific theories that begin to emerge. Again, using Google, using engrams. You see around 1980, shareholder value suddenly uh, rises. You see agency theory suddenly rises. These are theories that translate the basic idea that the way to understand human beings is as rational, self-interested people, and the way to build systems for people is as strangers operating on each other through this idea of incentives, is the way to think about the world. It's not an ideology, it's just a fact. And all of these take off both at the highest level of abstraction in terms of rationality and incentives, and in particular doctrine at that moment. Quickly going over the core pillars of this theory because then I'll try to play out how commons actually reverse all of these assumptions. The world is uncertain and complex. Therefore, planning by governments is impossible. Therefore, we need clear incentives for people to choose in the market. It's the only way to function. You need to re-deregulate. You need to increase quality of financial instruments. You need to lower taxes so that market works because it is impossible for governments to function properly. Rationality is best models of self-interest. I've said this again, and it ties to these institutional things that have driven inequality. Collective action fails. People always are, want to grab for their own pocket. Collective action fails, and therefore we need to disconnect to free markets from the state, from, so from, from social uh, control, and simply release the animal spirits, as it were, of the market. Freedom itself depends on choice in markets, and property is the core model. However, <clears throat> Beginning around 1990 and beyond, we had these two major schools of the commons. One focused much more on more traditional, um, uh, e ecologically stable commons that came out of the work of Lynn Ostrom and the Workshop on Political Theory in Indiana, which has gotten tremendous respect within the economics in, uh, uh, um, uh, profession, partly because it was so discreetly fact-based and careful and conceptual, and partly because it touched the peripheries of the global capital economy. And the other is us. The other is the theoretically impossible fact of free and open source software. The theoretically impossible fact for Wikipedia. The theoretically impossible fact of Firefox. It wasn't the state regulatory agencies that broke the Microsoft monopoly. It was, in fact, uh, on Internet, it was, in fact, free software. It's that theoretical impossibility was what changed. And then the practice, back, as Rick said, to talking to the executives, across the conception of what it is to build an economically plausible story of the world, you can't ignore this. Nowhere was this more powerful than in free software, because there you have companies simply adopting. Who, whoever in 1995 would have predicted that a bunch of free software developers would beat Microsoft in the web server market, which was one of its core next generation applications, would have been laughed out of the room as incompetent. I guess it was in 2001 in Toulouse, Larry, that you and I were described as communists uh, for suggesting that this was plausible. Um, and yet it moves over boom and bust cycle. At this point, for 20 years, it moves. And if you're worried about the end there, it's just spammers. Uh, when you look at top sites and active sites, uh, things are continuing, and the only thing that's rising is engine uh, free software. So there is the force of fact not at the peripheries of the global economy, but at the very core of innovation and growth that everyone who believes in that old model understands as the core of what matters. Essentially, we are now able to tell a factually grounded story 
that if the first two-thirds of the 20th century were about rationalization through bureaucracy, both in market action and in state, and if the 1980s and 90s were the implementation of neoliberal politics by pushing everything into market and price-based system, even within big companies, even within nonprofit organizations, what we're seeing today is essentially a re-emergence of a networked information in society where for the first time since uh, the Industrial Revolution, the most important inputs into the core economic activities of the most advanced economies are widely distributed in the population. We've essentially seen, and this was true, I'd say, uh, up until the last couple of years with the emergence of new efforts to harness these for more market-oriented or more extractive models, the emergence of a solution space to an entire range of problems, both at the core of purely social beliefs, uh, uh, relations and in a variety of public and private, market and not market, centralized and decentralized models to actually build social production into the general system. One of the things that has been a result is that the commons has started to emerge as a displacement for other models of the public good or the shared good. You look at how the word the commons has emerged since the 1990s as an organizing concept to begin to push back on some of these core ideas. And where the public good reaches a certain peak and begins to decline, the commons um, uh, is continuing to emerge as an organizing concept. Why and in what way? Let's try to look at some of the things as they come out of creative uh, commons itself. What does attribution mean? Mine doesn't mean for sale. Property may be important to connect person and to create a certain sense of, of relationship, but that doesn't mean it has to be a commodity. It's not the only place to relate. And conversely, sharing doesn't mean erasing of the self. You can keep the individual you don't have to collectivize the individual, and at the same time, you also don't have to commodi commodify. Liberty of an individual does not translate necessarily into commodification of that individual. A robust system of social exchange can be and is independent of market exchange. The point is, this isn't new. It's not as though we all had all market relations all the time. It's that just that the shared ideology of the professional classes was all of that is on the side, what we do at home, what we do with our neighbors, what we do with our friends, the whole way in which we organize so much of our material and intellectual lives is just a footnote. The core of the action is the market. No, both of them exist, and they exist alongside each other. A core commitment to an ethic of reciprocity that is central to who we are as human beings. Sharing is not something we do on the side. Reciprocity is not something that we do on the side. It's central to explaining who we are as human beings in society. There's an insistence when you look at the foundation is not complete rejection of the property model. It's a reimagination. You keep yourself, you keep your individual integrity, you keep your sense of being able to both be part of and apart from the uh, uh, collective, as we see in the idea that I can retain the integrity of my work if that's what's important to me. And fundamentally, that creativity, freedom of speech and thought all depend on a robust public domain. That it's not that there's property and then there's a little bit of leftover commons, but that commons are integral to all market societies, whether it's the roads or the navigable waters or uh, uh, the basis of knowledge. Everywhere, we cannot exist in complex society without uh, commons. Largely, there are three schools of the commons. As I said, the first one is the Ostrom School of common property regimes uh, and the idea of institutional analysis and development. Our universe of the commons, information commons and open access, and to some extent more in the, in, in the environmental movement, the idea of a global commons and the idea of a shared stewardship of a set of, 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 uh, uh, commitment, of, of resources that make us all uh, uh, together. When we look at the core idea of uncertainty and complexity require markets and private action, what we learn from the Ostrom School is that uncertainty and complexity mean that property also fails. 
and individual incentives based on property is also highly imperfect because as it turns out, when you need to standardize exactly every single little bit so that you can price it, you lose a lot of information. One of the things that happened in all of these resource environments that the Ostrom School studied was that it was exactly the local knowledge and the complexity of how things were different given this particular community allowed them to create a more sustainable model. And obviously from our own experience, the public domain and commons-based exploration allowed for diverse people using diverse resources to apply diverse knowledge bases and to experiment. It, cre it meant that our innovation, growth, creativity were an evolutionary process, not something that could be managed from the start and required enormous experimentation. Property hampers learning rather than improves it when that is the condition you are in. If you imagine a universe where at the origin you know exactly who knows what and what they can do. You know exactly what you need to do, and it's very expensive. That's easy to do within property or managerial hierarchies. Over there at the bottom, you can optimize, you can use incentives, you can, uh, 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 you can uh, appropriate and focus on appropriability because you don't need to experiment and explore. But in so many of the areas that are critical to innovation and growth, you don't know who knows what. You don't know what's the right question. You don't know what needs to be learned. And it's in that space out there where you don't know that along each of these dimensions with these trade-offs, instead of clear incentives, what we need are diverse motivations. Instead of appropriability, what we need to focus on is in freedom to operate and freedom to tinker. Instead of optimization, what we need is exploration and experimentation. And this is the domain of the commons. And what's important about this domain of the commons is that without it, all we can do is keep squeezing the penny for the last piece. We can't expand, we can't grow. And it's this continuous play between the open experimentation in diverse motivation. This is the domain of open science. This is the domain of the classic views of science. This is the domain where open access allows you to actually pull together the regional data set so that you can learn more rapidly rather than focus specifically on the appropriation for this publisher or that. This is the domain in which we live and without which modern market society would atrophy. It's not an ideology, it's a fact. We are living it for 20 years. So we see commons-based production, utilizing these resources that no one exercise exclusive rights, appropriating outputs without asserting rights, and sharing. It can be individual or collaborative. It can be commercial or non-commercial. This is what's so creative about Creative Commons, as you said, the fact that you can mine all of these. But what's critical is that it separate, it locates authority to act where we can actually act. We, in our own bodies, with our own social relations, can act. But the legal system locates the authority to act elsewhere. The Commons gives it back. So where do we see this? We see this with creativity and remix, so much of the anchor of what made this uh, uh, central to uh, the experience of cultural production. And we see it in creating culture, we see it in innovation. One of the things that's been fascinating to look at is the fact that even in things where it shouldn't work, like spectrum management, we've seen that just opening up spectrum for open exploration has incredibly empowered lots of industries to be innovative. So in smart grid infrastructures in the US, the majority of the market uses unlicensed wireless, not licensed. In wireless healthcare, the majority of the market uses unlicensed wireless, not wireless. Even in mobile broadband, the majority of data runs on Wi-Fi uh, and Wi-Fi repeater systems, not uh, uh, on proprietary data. When you look at access control, inventory management, all of the things that are so central. This, in 1996, when I first started talking about Spectrum Commons, the appropriate economist's response was, that's silly. It just happens to be the world we live in. It's not ideology, it's fact. A core target of the Ostrom Commons work was Mansour Olson's logic of collective action. The idea, the deeply corrosive idea that if people came to try to govern themselves together, we would fail because our self-interest would tear us apart. 
Those common studies have showed uh, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, is no longer true. Increasingly today, the experience of millions of people around the world creating together and governing themselves online has provided us a rich factual basis to understand that it's not true. Commons-based licensing, the, the, the heart of Creative Commons, is a way for people to govern themselves collectively using law, but using law for open purposes. The cynicism about the possibility of shared values, and here it's more the left than the right that has been central to the critique and the postmodern critique, also is rejected. We can have rough consensus. We can understand share, we can have shared normative frameworks and debate about them. We can have a sense of meritocracy and what works and what doesn't work for us given our normative shared. We show it over and over again that even though in theory we can't, in practice we can. We know how to build redundant spheres of nested and overlapping power. The studies, every computer supported cooperative work uh, 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 um, conference today has panels on panels dedicated to studying how Wikipedia governs itself, how this or that uh, free and open source software project governs itself, how all of these models work. They work. We can work together. Perhaps the most radical change of the last 20 years has been a shift across multiple disciplines in the scientific understanding of rationality. The high-end uh, understanding of rationality as self-interest with guile, the core of Homo economicus, reached its height in the early 90s, but has gradually been receding everywhere from evolutionary biology to experimental economics, from political science to organization theory, across multiple disciplines. What we've seen in the last 20, 25 years is a shift from Homo economicus operating with, on self-interest with guile to homo socialis, with diverse social motivations, pro, uh, responding to psychological, emotional, normative statements. We've seen a framework of moving from purely competition to cooperation. And we've seen the idea that this kind of individual that needs to be controlled in tightly coupled systems, in fact operates best through self-direction, through experimentation, through ethical engagement in loosely coupled systems. This is life in the commons on this side, life of people who are social and diverse, who cooperate and who combine self-direction and, and, and experimentation with ethical engagement with each other without having to control too tightly what we do. So we're moving to a concept of cooperative human systems, both at the conceptual, as I said, in terms of concepts of rationality, but also in terms of just building systems. The systems in Sharing Hub that you described are systems that need to be designed. Where is the design going to come from? We're seeing the emergence of a science of cooperation that has both basic science characteristics and design characteristics to build functioning cooperative systems. We are at the very early part of this moment. It's just the moment at which the paradigm shift can even be conceived. But that is the science of the future. And that is the organizational design and platform design of the future. That's where we're going, and that's what this organization is so central, a pillar of the recreation of future market society. <clears throat> Finally, for our purposes here, the idea that property-based incentives are necessary, and this comes to the global. A central part of what the Ostrom School tried to show was that the Washington Consensus, the development version of the same thing that applied in the US, the UK, et cetera, failed consistently because it destroyed local knowledge, it crowded out pro-social motivations, and it atrophied the social enforcement mechanisms that people were using, and so it left hollowed out areas. For us, I don't need to rehearse what we all, if we're in this room, already know. The systematic problems with patents and copyrights as ways of undermining innovation and creativity rather than supporting it, and the idea that prices can crowd out volunteerism. It's not that property can never work, but it, is not, it can't be seen as the foundational instrument. It needs to be only part of a, a general instrument. So we use the same, the, same, the same image because it captures so much. <clears throat> 
the moment at which we begin to understand so publicly and with political force that freedom to speak with the information environment we occupy is a core freedom and that we can come together not only as creators but also as political actors and create a foundation of some form of pragmatic political engagement that allows us to push back. Some of it is in politics, whether it's the Pirate Party. Some of it is in social mobilization, but it's absolutely central to who we are. So if we think of the Commons as idea, what does it do? It says people can effectively act collectively to govern how they use resources. It means we respond to diverse motivations. Sure, economic utility matters to us, but we also have a range of social, emotional, and rational ethical commitments that are no less powerful and you can't optimize on one without destroying the others. And the old understanding that property and markets and state planning are the only ways to organize the world is simply empirically false. We have a much richer range of ways of building things socially. Um, and cooperative social action in the commons can support growth and innovation. It's not just about anti-growth. It's about creating a more sustainable framework, sustainable in the ethical environment. And maybe, this is a major challenge that we'll need to understand, maybe uh, in the ecological environment as well. Perhaps even more profoundly deep is the understanding that we've gained that production and resource management are deeply socially embedded activities. You can't free markets from social embeddedness and expect a well-functioning system. All you get is extraction and things running out of control. We understand freedom as effective self-governance, both individual and collective, rather than merely a set of rights to create for the individual alone. Uh, and we understand that property-based markets can undermine the freedom in both of these senses. The stories in which in order to enforce property, you lean on people and constrain their freedom of creativity that have been so generative for this community are the basic stories with which we need to live to understand how things could um, um, go really wrong when you have this single-minded focus on property. So let me very quickly in just three or four minutes go into what is to be done um, and close there. The first is peer cooperativism. Um, the core practical um, uh, effect of free software was you have your proprietary system, we'll build our own with the freedom of the, that the capabilities will allow. We build our own and in some areas ranging from TCP, IP, and HTML as open standards through FOSS, et cetera, we actually have seen that this isn't a pipe dream. On the other hand, it's far from trivial. It's far from trivial. We've also seen failures over and over again. It's not something that you can just press a button and it will work. It's something we need to keep at. We need to keep working at. We need to identify critical uh, uh, capabilities that are necessary for sustaining the freedom, for sustaining the creativity, for sustaining the commons, and continue to develop those as uh, cooperative peers building uh, um, uh, alternative platforms. Um, obviously, one of the earliest was open access uh, for scientific publication. The effort to negotiate with the publishers is one thing, but just building our own is another. That was one. Um, We've seen, however, and this is the point I wanted to identify, we've seen, however, that in this domain of market-based decentralized, new bodies are emerging, Uber, Upwork, uh, TaskRabbit, that claim to be sharing economy or at least are described as sharing economy, but are not. One of the things we need to do is continue to insist that what the social meaning of the act is, is vastly more important than what its technical architecture is. Amazon Mechanical Turk is a form of alienated labor. The company works to try to make sure the workers can't talk to each other, models of extraction. The fact that it's organized in some transaction cost wave like something like, like uh, uh, Galaxy Zoo doesn't make it anything else. It doesn't make it a sharing platform or a platform for collaboration. It merely makes it a platform for contingent work. 
Sharing economy as Airbnb to be as opposed to couch surfing and then couch surfing itself um, um, uh, competing. We need to understand that sharing is a social relation, not a market structure. And, that, and to insist that what is sharing is that which is social. Whether or not, money might pass in some form or another. That's not anathema. People have to make a living. But what the core ethic is, as an ethic of sharing as opposed to an ethic of, of um, 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 ex uh, market exchange, is central. We're seeing a variety of players now trying to, we have a real tension as we move forward. If we're going to try to build something like a cooperative system where people can make a living from, um, um, uh, from work that is shared and cooperative, we're going to have to find models of mixing. Amara is an interesting model in terms of trying to pull together on one hand um, 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 peer translation of videos and on the other hand farming out money but making it in a form that is a cooperative form. This is far from anything other than, a, than, than, a, than a, uh, an experimental balloon but Lazuz is an effort to try to actually build a platform that would do some of the car sharing experiences but build it as a cooperative from the development on owned by owners and users and exchanged with its own internal currency experiments, not yet solutions. We also need to take from the uh, commons the knowledge that markets are socially embedded. And we need to insist on the fact that not all markets have to function on the extractive model. So if you look at a company like Gore, 10,000 co-owners, no hierarchy, lattice management, that's also a model. In Boston, where I live, last year there was a major strike in a cheap grocery store that's aimed at, at the, uh, um, some of the, the, the poorer segments or, or middle class and lower middle class segments of the population. The entire industrial action, as it were, the entire strike, which was disorganized because there's no union, was about who would be the CEO. It wasn't about the terms. Because there were two cousins who owned this. One wanted to go in the direction of a shareholder value model, and the other understood it as a going concern where the, the employees were the stakeholders. And all the employees wanted with the strike was to choose what kind of understanding of private ownership there would be. A private ownership that is shared and workers and consumers and owners are part of a common social enterprise or the shareholder value model. We need to do it firm by firm. We need to do it in law more generally. And finally, a model of peer pragmatism, citizenship modeled on peer self-governance. Again, all I want is to learn more about the things you described, Jay, in terms of um, we're seeing it now with, um, uh, with efforts to, uh, at civic hacking. We're seeing it now with efforts at building alternative systems. We're seeing it now. Um, <clears throat> We're seeing it now with efforts to even shape in Barcelona now, the victory of Barcelona in the Commons, efforts to shape um, 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 uh, political engagement around ideas of the Commons. So we have social mobilization like we had in Sopa Pippa. We have an effort to integrate into, into the political system. We have the efforts to develop platforms to continue engagement even when people successfully win. Uh, a seat or two in the parliament uh, from our perspective. Uh, we see all of these together. So here's how I want to wrap this up. Sometimes you look at Wikipedia and what you see is a Rorschach test. Everybody sees in it what it wants. When you are in the individual battles of copyright, of open access, when you're in the room with people who simply want this extension of copyright or that extension of patent, correctly you fight the particular battle. When you're in the room with people who want to reorganize the governance of this company or that company, correctly you're in that battle. But throughout these, I think it's important that we all recognize that we're also part of an intellectual moment in the history of early 21st century capitalism. We're standing at the end of 40 years of dominance of an idea that has underwritten, not just at this high level, but at very practical management strategy issues, an extractive model of capitalism. It's not the only model. There is another model, and we 
represent its very core. Thank you. And in a thousand years, when all our bones have disappeared, and every word has been erased.